yes sir now it's 3 o'clock uh, shall we start sir yes yes yeah yes sir now it's okay okay thank you thank you very much good afternoon everybody uh, first of all let me on behalf of the samaya vidya vihar university and on behalf of the society of polymer science india mumbai chapter let me welcome each and every one of you for this important webinar on a topic which is very relevant which has been always relevant let me also take this opportunity to welcome personally mr sajit mitra who is the chair person uh, for this uh, function um, mr chanchal das gupta who is giving the main speech mr neet neeraj dikshit and mr tk bindopadhyay uh, who are sharing perspectives on this particular topic i also see very eminent uh, people from the poly polymer industries i see prakash trivedi sitting good afternoon Pro uh, dr prakash trivedi good afternoon well, and welcome to the meeting and uh, let me also welcome my colleagues in the executive committee of the mumbai chapter of the society of polymer science india a senior scientist from in the area of polymers and plastics across the country distinguished academics and researchers from the academia as well as industry dear students who are participating even now i am getting that they are not getting connected and all that dear students who are participating in different academic from different academic institutions uh, teachers researchers other distinguished invitees and those who are attending uh, this webinar for the next 19 uh, minutes or 90 plus minutes uh, through the youtube and other channels ladies and gentlemen uh, samaya vidya vihar university is fortunate to have a tie up with the society of polymer science india uh, we initiated the mumbai chapter uh professor mam sharma inaugurated that chapter and uh, from that day onwards we have been very active uh, interacting with industry in a very significant way so amaya vidya vihar university is also a very premier institution very unique institution in this country in the sense that the samaya vidya vihar institutions have been in existence for more than seven decades in uh, in this uh, in maharashtra and gujarat and in karnataka uh, in some rural areas in school, uh, schools and all that and uh, last year our higher education institutions which are in the self financing sector uh, got transformed into the first self financing private university in the city of mumbai it is the first self financing of course you will say that nmim has all these they are deemed universities but this is a university enacted by the state legislature it is not just a, a single faculty university it's a multi faculty university consisting of management technology engineering humanities social sciences arts literature gujarati marathi languages uh, culture cultural forms several several things we have also uh, one of the probably the, the, the best startup initiative also in our campus we have uh, two big campuses in the city one in uh, the somaya vidya vihar ghat copper east and uh, the other is in sion our medical college campus it's called ayurvika and this university is recognized by the ugis uh, university grants commission and also all all our colleges are top accredited uh, by nac and other accreditation agencies and uh, now we have also around two, around 200 uh, qualified phd research guides in the faculty of engineering management technology and related areas uh, so far we have been uh, working as centers recognized centers of the mumbai university kavi kulaguru kalidas university and other universities now our own phd program uh, research undergraduate research postgraduate research 
and postdoctoral research we are undertaking and we have around uh, of course we, in the higher education uh, system we have around 600 teachers total we have around 2000 teachers right from kindergarten to uh, at the doctoral level and we have also good number of uh, collaborations with industries our of course man management they are also in the industrialists bio refinery mr so samir somaya is the chair uh, chancellor of the university and chairperson of the whole institutions he is also a member of the of course many of you may be knowing him uh, indian chemical council and a number of other organizations uh, harvard educated uh, mr samir somaya he is the chancellor of our institution i thought of just uh, introducing you to the university and welcoming you to the university to be part and parcel of, of real uh, collaboration with the university and uh, we have even during the last one uh, year we could see uh, concrete examples of effective uh, collaboration which is happening in the at the ground level not just on paper thank you very much and this opportunity again and consider it as a great opportunity to interact with you all and then bring uh, you all to the uh, academic system of the somaya vidya vihar university and benefit mutually out of it as of, i mentioned about the society of polymer science india for it's a four decade old organization and we have we are all, we are also running a, a post graduate program in polymer science we want to be a model like the brooklyn polytechnic which is very top in uh, polymer science of course several institutions are in model but we are just starting uh, let me let me not waste uh, much of the time and let me welcome each and every one of you and uh, now the, the flow of the program is something like that it has all of course we have been in touch for the last 15 20 days we have been in regular touch i used to see the i mean interest of uh, uh, from the polymer update mr sajit mehta uh, mr nera travel and uh, we have been in continuous correspondence with, for making this effort very very fruitful i uh, let me have the privilege of introducing the chairperson of this particular conference of course i know him for maybe for the last 45 or two two months that is my personal knowledge but i have read about him uh, he's no he is of course my introduction will be limited to the topic which we are discussing but he is beyond that uh, working in several uh, several uh, activities which is which is culture uh, arts and number of number of other areas he's the uh, mr sajit mehta of course um, probably he may not require any introduction the bombay people but let me on um, for formality sake introduce him he is the ceo and the founder of polymer update polymer update as many of you know it is the asia's largest and world's fastest growing petrochemical market intelligence company he is also the founder of the uh, p world tech creators of uh, polymer exchange the world's first and simplest plastics trading platform uh, mr mehta is strongly and passionately uh, committed to the problems of the environment something remarkable the conferences the race that is um, uh, acronym for recycling and circular economy i had occasion to attend one conference i could see the type of uh, global uh, corporate global cooperation and global interventions in um, in environment management and circular economy which is very important and of course i am glad to say that we are also teaching circular economy as part of our polymer science uh, program so uh, he uh, he also uh, has several platforms to create a, edu to provide education and create awareness about industries all types of industries related to polymer plastics not just marketing intelligence prediction other activities also so she is committed and uh, uh, i am glad that he is also uh, on our industrial advisory board uh, recently he has agreed to be on our industrial advisory board of the uh, somaya vidyavakar university let with this very short introduction let me uh, welcome mr sajit mita to conduct the webinar uh, you, it is for you to take, uh, decide what to do. Thank you very much. And let me also welcome Mr. Chanchal Das Gupta, and they will be introduced uh, properly at a, at a later time. Thank you very much. Chanchal Das Gupta, and of course, T.K. Bandhu Bhatiaya and Neeraj Dechit. And I see my colleagues 
who are working with uh, the, uh, the uh, departments, let me welcome once again all of you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Pillay, for your very kind introduction. Very, very kind. And a very big thank you to the Society of Polymer Science India, Mumbai chapter, to the Samaya Vidya Vihar University for this wonderful opportunity to moderate today's session, which I believe, and I promise all those present on this webinar, will be a very informative and very, very interesting one. So even though Vice Chancellor Pillay has said a few words about what I, what I do, and I'm humbly grateful for that, I would still, if I may, just give you a further brief note on Polymer Update. I promise you it'll be brief. Uh, yes, uh, we have been Asia's number one market intelligence company in the petrochemical space now for the past 20 years. And with a recently opened office in Europe, a newly registered office in the UAE, and a soon to op open office in Kampala, Uganda, we are slowly but surely racing towards becoming the world's number one market intelligence company for petrochemicals. Uh, what we provide is business critical industry news, real time price assessments, which are used as benchmarks for contract price settlements in many parts of Asia and the Middle East. Uh, Polymer Update has a fast widening subscriber base with clients in over 65 countries. So why is it that we have become so popular? What are the reasons why the world has accepted us and uh, turned to us as a uh, destination for getting their information? Well, credible, neutral, and regular reporting has attracted thousands of subscribers who include most leading resin producers, processors, distributors, traders, consultant firms, investment bankers, credit rating agencies, as well as front runners in the international services, news and media companies. And backed by years of extensive experience in providing business critical content, Polymer Update is much coveted by a vast readership that spans the globe. Uh, we at Polymer Update empower our subscribers through accurate pricing data and market moving news, reports, analysis, price forecasting tools, and articles on current and future trends in the industry. In fact, according to Thomson Reuters, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with Thomson Reuters, uh, Polymer Update has long set the gold standard for its breadth and depth of coverage in petrochemical products and industrial polymers. It has developed a proven proprietary pricing model and methodology that drives timely and more profitable purchasing decisions. Uh, this kind of credible stamp from Thomson and Reuters has given us a great amount of uh, encouragement and confidence to take our product out to the world, and the world is accepting us at a very, very fast pace. And we also have something called Polymer Update TV, which is the world's first digital news channel dedicated to the global petrochemical industry. We have about 5,000 subscribers, and ladies and gentlemen, you too can subscribe to Polymer Update TV on YouTube and get free access to our daily petrochemical intelligence. So uh, coming to today's really, really interesting topic, uh, ladies and gentlemen, given the topic of Chanchalji's presentation, I thought I would present you with a brief perspective on India's current polymer consumption against the background of what is perceived today to be a weak economy on account of the pandemic. So as a result of COVID, many of you will agree that there is an overbearing sense of doom and gloom, not only across the world, but in India too. Clearly India is no exception. We repeatedly hear on business channels these days about how our economy is shrinking, how India's GDP has fallen by its steepest extent ever, 23.9% in the April to June quarter, and how other than the agriculture sector, all sectors including construction, manufacturing, and services have suffered major declines. Last year in the same quarter, India's economy grew by 5.2%. And due to the pandemic, we now have this frightening fall of nearly 24%. However, I would like to highlight the recent CPI numbers. For those of you who may not be familiar with the acronym CPI, it is simply Consumer Price Index, which is an index measuring retail inflation in the economy by collecting the change in prices of most common goods and services used by consumers. So CPI inflation today is at 7%. But with food inflation muted, Commodity infl inflation also muted. If CPI is at 7%, clearly all is in doom and gloom. On the contrary, the months of July and August have seen improvement and going forward, I expect things will continue to improve as India unlocks. What is important to note here is that maybe, just maybe, the gloom which most are speaking about 
may just end up being a boom for India. Now, how you want, may wonder, and I'm sure all of you are thinking that what is this gentleman talking about? Well, there is one value investor in India whose visionary thinking resonates very well with my overall approach to the capital markets. And this brilliant thinker, his name is Mr. Saurabh Mukherjee of Marcellus Investment. He says that if you look back in India, 40 years, our country has had four economic booms. Every time the US economy slips into a recession, in year T plus one, India has had an economic boom. In 1980, 81, the US was in recession. In 82, India had its first economic boom since independence. This lasted till 86, 87. In 91, 92, the US again slipped into recession. And in 93, India went, witnessed its second economic boom, which lasted until 97. In 2000, 2001, America was once again in recession. And in 2003, our economic boom began and lasted until 2008. And we all know what happened in 2008 with Lehman Brothers, which in turn resulted in a recession in the US, followed by, I, I'm guessing you guessed it, by a boom in India in 2009, 2011. And since then, we've not seen an economic boom, and yet India's per capita consumption of plastics has steadily climbed. So as per Polymer Update's estimates, India in 2019 consumed a little over 15 million metric tons of plastic and the per capita figure stood at around 11 kgs. This is well below the world average of 28 kgs and sharply lower than the US where plastic consumption is at a staggering 109 kgs per capita. Today, the US is in recession and Polymer Update believes that like we have seen over the past 40 years, India will soon see the start of yet another economic boom in our country. I'm sure many of you must be wondering, but why does a US recession trigger a boom in India? What is the connection between the two economies? Is it merely a coincidence that on the back of every recession in America over the past 40 years, India's economy has ridden on an upward economic growth trajectory? Well, there are key, two key drivers to this. The first, low oil, oil prices, cheap oil. The US today is the world's largest consumer of oil. In 2019, the US consumed an average of around 19.5 million barrels of oil per day. In comparison, China consumed 14 million, while India consumed around 5.2 million. Again, you may ask, how does this fit in with India's economic boom? Well, the answer is quite simple. When the world's largest oil consumer goes into a recession, oil prices globally tumble, anywhere between 50 to 80%. This year too, with the US being in recession, prices of crude are down 55%. India has an 82.8% dependence on imported oil, making us the third largest importer in the world after the US and China. So if you give India a 50% drop in oil prices, that is a huge 3% GDP stimulus to our country. In fact, it is from this 3% that our honorable prime minister has given our economy a 2% stimulus to help us recover from the devastating impact of the pandemic. There's still room for 1% more. The second thing after cheap oil that a US recession does is it makes the cost of money cheaper. The US 10-year bond yield is the world's risk-free rate. And typically in a US recession, we see this falling between two and 3%. In Jan 2020, it was 3% and today it is zero. This fall, ladies and gentlemen, allows the Reserve Bank of India to cut interest rates so far, the RBI has cut rates by 2%, and I suspect they will further slash rates this fiscal. So based on what history has taught us, cheap oil and cheap money equals to an Indian economic boom. This will be India's fifth economic boom, and we at Polymer Update believe rural India will play a key role this time around. Today, Mr. Chanchal Das Gupta will speak to us about the journey of polymers to plastics. He will talk about how polymers are the workhorse of the modern economy due to several reasons, availability, versatility, but most of all, because they're virtually unrivaled in terms of great performance at a low cost. We at Polymer Update believe that plastics will play an important role in India's fifth economic boom. Plastics will find a wider range of uses than ever before. And within the next two to three years, we believe that India's polymer consumption will cross 20 million metric tons per annum. Dependence on plastics will increase rapidly, not only in urban India, but rural India too. And this growth will be supported by our pressing need for consumer durables, electronics, packaging, fuel efficient vehicles, 
space exploration, air travel, and the list can go on and on and on. On account of the long-term stability of plastics because of its good weatherability, stable properties, durability, excellent chemical resistance, et cetera, plastics will play a vital role in India's future growth. So ladies and gentlemen, on that positive note, I was given 10 minutes, so I will try and complete it. On that positive note, I would like to invite Mr. Chanchal Das Gupta to present his paper. A chemical engineering student graduated from Jadavpur University, Kolkata in 1986. Chanchalji worked for Indian Petrochemicals Corporation Limited, IPCL, in technical services and application development of polymer raw materials. He is presently working for Baruj India Private Limited since the past 19 years, initially for flexible and rigid packaging, and for the past 12 years for infrastructure applications like pressure pipe and steel pipe coating. Chanchalji is an international expert on steel pipe coating for cross-country pipelines. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Chanchal Das Gupta. Good afternoon, Sajidji, for your nice introduction, uh, which is very humbling. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity, Professor Pillai. Um, I welcome to all the friends of SPSI and my respect to my one of my gurus, Mr. T.K. Bandopadhyay. So with this, I'll start uh, my presentation. The subject of the presentation is journey from polymers to plastics, the polyurethane story. Is my screen visible to all? Yes. Your screen is visible, attentively. Please go ahead. Okay. So this will be the uh, brief agenda for my lecture. Uh, I'll start with the introduction, polymer plastics and their classification, how polymers are synthesized, what are polyolithins, and their parameters including polymer properties, additives and their functions, more polymerization technologies, major polymerization technologies for polyolithins, and plastic circular economy. Uh, there are many facets of uh, you know polymer, especially polyolithins, uh, but all have not been covered. For example, processing. These will form the future, uh, you know, lectures uh, under the same banner, uh, which will be very interesting. Where the new uh, lectures and new speakers can come. So today, this is the scope of my lecture. Now, before starting, I'll give a small introduction to Buruj. Uh, Buruj, uh, the name means Burj or strong tower, which you can see in the corner of the court. Guru was formed in uh, 2000 by a joint venture between Abu Dhabi National Oil Company and Borealis. And in 20 years, it has uh, really established itself as a strong tower in the polymer industry. Uh, Guru is leading provider of innovative value-creating polyolithin solutions. We have around 3,000 employees globally. We have a large uh, integrated polyolefin complex with an annual capacity of 4.5 million tons and this is now further being expanded uh, in two stages first stage it will go to 7 million tons and in the next phase by 2030 they reach 10 million tons we have a state of that innovation center in ua application center in shanghai china and the innovation is guided by our product sustainability index Buruj manufactures a whole range of polyolefin solutions for packaging to keep food fresh for a long time, for agriculture to cut down the water consumption by 75%, uh, increase the yield per acre, for healthcare following the strictest global regulations, for mobility that is automotive compound to make cars lighter, more fuel efficient and reduce the carbon footprint for energy, that is wire and cable insulation and jacketing material to save uh, transmission losses and handle very high voltage. And uh, finally, infrastructure, which is one of the major sectors, uh, which means water and gas pipe, uh, steel pipe coating for protection of cross-country pipelines, 
hot and cold water and industrial pipes. Uh, we were the footprint of Buruj. We are spread from East Africa through the Middle East countries, through Indian subcontinent, South Asia, Australia, New Zealand, up to China and Japan. And all the major uh, important cities, we have our offices. Now coming to the uh, main topic, which is polymers, plastics, and their classification. The polymers, as uh, all the uh, students of uh, Somaya knows, that their chemical compounds formed when small chemical units or monomers, they join together to form large molecules with a regular repeating structure. So if this is the monomers, then under the action of heat, pressure and catalyst, they form the polymer chains. And then further, when you use these polymers uh, to make them uh, suitable for the end use application, I think my screen is not moving. Yeah, so these polymers, when they're just produced, they're not suitable for the end use. They're not thermally and oxidatively stable. So you add various additives and pigments to make them suitable for making useful products. And then they are called plastics. Uh, to give an example how properties change drastically with increase in size of the molecules, uh, CH4, single carbon hydrocarbon, methane, which is a gas, C8H18, 8 carbon octane, it is a liquid which is used in automobiles, C50H102, paraffin wax, which is a you know soft solid which is used for candles and various other industrial uses. Uh, but when you come to polyethylene, so C2000H4002, this is a typical you know representation, it can be even much higher it becomes a strong solid. So the same hydrocarbon uh, molecules repeating and joining to each other, their property gets completely transformed. Coming to the classification, polymers can be classified as according to source, like natural polymers, protein, starch, or cellulose, semi-synthetic polymers like cellulose acetate, and synthetic polymers like polyethylene, polypropylene, and polyethylene terephthalate or polyester. Based on reuse and recycle, thermoset polymers like uh, thermoset polyesters, melamine, you can process them only one, once to convert into a product. After that, you cannot remelt them and form again. So their recyclability is limited, reuse is limited. Whereas thermoplastics like polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, PET, nylon, you can melt them as many number of time as you want and again form into different products. According to production processes, yes, please. Uh, I think somebody's uh, mic is not muted. According to production processes, Addition polymerization, polyethylene, polypropylene, and polystyrene, where the same molecule keeps repeating and produce a polymer uh, where there is no reaction product or byproduct during the process. Whereas in condensation polymerization, like PET, nylon, or polyurethane, when the molecules join, there is a byproduct given away which can be water or carbon dioxide or similar. So there is a reaction product which is generated side by side the polymerization. Then when you come to performance application, uh, you have commodity plastics, polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC, polystyrene, which have got very bulk uses uh, and they are uh, very, very cost competitive. They are produced in millions of tons. Then you have engineering plastics with 
very high mechanical prop mechanical and other properties they are produced in thousands of tons and they are quite expensive compared to com commodity plastics and in com performance plastics which are very very specialty polymers they are sold in tons and also they are much more expensive even compared to engineering plastics now how polymers are synthesized and what are polyolefins in any polymer production process uh, generally there is a cracking of uh, natural gas or naphtha or other resources then you get the monomers you convert them into polymers by polymerization process you compound with additives then you do processing for example extrusion or glow molding and then maybe secondary conversion like printing or lamination and after it gives its useful life then it is recycled now recycled all recycling also can be done in different ways the plastic waste can be remelted and reformed into a different product it can be used for heat generation for fuel in another industry it can be converted into the basic uh, molecules like it can be converted into oils which can be used for you know automobile or other applications or for energy and in some cases they can be converted into monomer and again polymerized so this is how a uh, polymer life cycle goes on and here i mainly mean the thermoplastic polymers are polymer chains visible to the naked eye to give you an uh, idea of scale one pellet of say polyethylene uh, weighs about 10 mg and it may contain up to 10 to the power 17 molecular chains and every chain is made out of 2000 to 20000 building blocks or ethylenes ethylene molecules so they are not visible to the naked eye though the polymer chains are very very big in size how polymers are synthesized uh, if we talk of ethylene monomer carbon carbon double bond the other two bonds are you know occupied by hydrogen Uh, you can use either free radicals or by catalyst to open this double bond and then other ethylene molecules can come and join to form a very long chain in some cases like in case of low density polyethylene no catalyst is needed you just initiate the chain by initiator and then the polymer reaction grows and when it has reached a particular size range we chain modified you stop the reaction and separate out the polymer uh, in case of other advanced uh, polyolefins and also to bring down the uh, reaction temperature and reaction pressure drastically so that it is more economic and less risky you use catalyst and uh, you can uh, really adjust the molecular architecture add different types of polymer and co-monomer etc using the catalyst technique now this shows the basic uh, you know polymerization process and if you replace one hydrogen molecule in ethylene with another molecule say for example uh, propylene then it becomes polypropylene if you replace r with vinyl chloride it becomes polyvinyl chloride with styrene it becomes polystyrene with acrylonitrile it becomes polyacrylonitrile so the uh, addition reactions uh, these are very similar in nature with different uh, starting molecules now polyolefins are basically homologous homologous polymers of homologous series cnh2n for example if you make a polymer of polyethylene which is c2h4 poly uh, propylene c3h6 or butene c4h8 these are all forming for falling in polyolefins category and the major polyolefins in terms of uh, production and usage are polyethylene and polypropylene so basically whenever we are talking of polyolefins it basically 
covers polyethylene and polypropylene and there are few other polyolefins also like polybutene etc now as i told you addition polymerization uh, there there is no byproduct of the reaction the same repeating molecule keeps on getting added to the chain like propylene to polypropylene uh, with the help of opening of double bond and then they form the polymers but if you talk of condensation polymerization for example terephthalic acid with ethylene glycol under heat pressure and catalyst you form a dimer and a water molecule is released then another molecule will get added there a trimer will be formed another water molecule will come out and like that you make oligomers and then to final polymers and in each reaction it will reduce release water molecule so this is condensation polymerization or step growth now coming little bit about the polymer uh, properties which are the main poly parameters influencing polymer properties i have uh, considered six parameters number one is molecular weight molecular weight is very difficult to measure uh, so melt flow rate is measured to have an idea of molecular weight and it is inversely proportional that is the higher the molecular weight lower is the melt flow rate and vice versa then you have molecular weight distribution the density chain branching the polymers can have uh, linear chains uh, without any branches linear chain with short chain branches and then uh, long chain branched polymers you have the crystalline structure there are semi crystalline and amorphous polymers and stereol irregularity like isotactic syndactic or atactic for polypropylene i have come in my future slides now coming to molecular weight higher the molecular weight lower is the mfr and for different application you need different uh, molecular weight range to give you some example for example polyethylene melt flow rate is measured at uh, 190 degree centigrade and 2.16 kg or 5 kg load so to keep things simple i have only considered 5 kg load mfr and to give an example injection molding it uses mfr between 8 to 300 blow molding uses anything between 0.8 to 1.5 pressure pipe uses 0.2 to 1.1 very very low mfr hmhdp film they use 0.1 to 0.2 mfr and blow molding which are up more than 200 liter big drums they use less than 0.1 mfr if you talk of polypropylene there the mfr is measured at 230 degree centigrade and 2.16 kg load so typical application and the corresponding mfrs melt blown fiber it requires 1200 to 2000 mfr material injection molding of large parts 25 to 80 multifilament 12 15 packaging film like cable point film typically 10 to 12 mfr raffia bopp 2.5 4.0 and hot water pipe uh, which is used for plumbing application it is about 0.3 now we come to molecular weight distribution as you know mole molecules of polymers are of different sizes and there is a range of uh, you know chain lengths mfr is only a Uh, reflection of the average molecular weight so there are different types of molecular weight which are measured number average molecular weight which is average there is a number of molecules of each size weight average molecular weight which is average based on weight of molecule of each size and there is something called molecular weight distribution or polydispersity which is very simplified way calculated as mw by mn uh, weight average molecular weight by number average molecular weight which will give you an idea of how broad or how narrow is the molecular weight and this molecular weight distribution affect polymer property uh, these are normally determined by gpc and geology 
And to give you some example, broad molecular weight uh, polyethylene is suitable for film and pipe extrusion and extrusion coating. Narrow molecular weight uh, is suitable for injection molding and rotational molding. So uh, each technology also have different type of capabilities in terms of manufacturing, you know, narrow molecular weight and broad molecular weight. For example, bimodal technologies can make broad molecular weight polymers much easily than unimodal technologies. I'll come in my future slides, more details. Talking of chain branching, uh, these are some pictorial representation of uh, branched or long chain, for example, high pressure LDP, and the chains are ethylene chains. Uh, the linear chain example is high molecular or high density polyethylene hardly any side branches and their densities are also quite high because when they're linear, no branches, molecules can come closer, more crystalline area can be formed and density can go up. Then linear molecule with short chain, example is LLDP, MDP, linear MDP and HDP. And here the uh, short chain branches are basically of homonomers, whether I make it a butene, Pomonomer HDP or exim pomonomer LLDP, these pomonomers form these side chain branches, whereas in long chain branch polymers, it is short polyethylene uh, chains which form the long branches. So what matters is number of branches, length of branches, uh, and they contribute in terms of density, mechanical property balance, optical property, and environmental stress crack resistance. Specific examples are male strength of LDP. LDP is a very good male strength, which comes from the branched, uh, uh, long chain branch structure. High stress crack resistance of LLDP. Despite being similar in density to LDP, LLDP stress crack resistance is much, much higher, which is contributed by the short chain branching of butene or other homonomer. Then high down gauging property of HMHDP. HMHDP film can be down gauged to you know, 5 micron. That is because of very, very linear structure, which uh, you know uh, helps easy uh, flow of molecules past each other. Coming to density. Now, density for polyethylene has got a real big significance because polyethylene is classified in terms of density. You have uh, low density polyethylene, medium density polyethylene, and high density polyethylene. According to ASTM D3350, the 910 to 925 density range is called LDP, 926 to 940 is called MDP, and 941 to maximum HDP density, what we have seen is about 970. This is called high density polyethylene. Now, also to give you some example of how, you know, the developments took place from LDP to MDP to HDP to, you know, other special types of HDP. If you look at the properties of LDP, tensile stiffness, thermal resistance, chemical resistance, they are low and chemical resistance is medium. What is good is high impact strength and high, very good processability. Even ESCR is low. Now, when you added homonomers into it, made it LLDP or MDP, you went up in certain properties like tensile improved, stiffness improved, thermal resistance improved, uh, impact strength uh, did not become so good, but still it was okay. Yes, here there was significant improvement and processability was still not as good. Then when you go to even further uh, higher density, you have really improved tensile stiffness, thermal resistance, but your chemical resistance is still weak, impact is low, ESCR is low, and processability is low. And this I am mainly talking of HDP homopolymer, which is 960 to 970 density range. Then came the copolymers, where you are close to you know 941 to 9. 60, 958 range, there you could increase other than tensile stiffness, thermal, also the chemical resistance because of the homonomer, you could increase the impact strength and ESCR, 
processability is still not so good as LDP or other uh, homopolymers. Therefore, then came bimodal copolymers. By using two reactors, you could tailor make the molecular distribution, make it a wide molecular distribution, and you could really improve the processability so that high molecular weight polymers could be processed without much problem. But for polypropylene, density does not change. All the different types of polypropylene are within a very narrow range of density, which is 0 0.9, 0 0.895 to 0 0.910. There is no high density polypropylene. But in case of polypropylene, stereo regularity becomes very important. Why stereo regularity? Because ethylene is a very symmetrical molecule. All the four corner molecules are hydrogen. But in propylene, you have three hydrogen and one, uh, you know, ethyl group, a methyl group rather. So, where will be this methyl group's position or pendant group's position? That influences the properties a lot. So, if they are all on one side of the chain, it is called isotactic. If they are random, it is atactic. And if they are sinusoidal, alternating molecules, it is syndactic. Now. Uh, commercially available polypropylene are mix of isotactic and very small percentage of atactic. Uh, in fact, uh, initially when the catalyst systems were not good, there was higher atactic production. So atactic had to be separated from isotactic. But nowadays catalyst activities are so good that small quantity of atactic goes with the polymer only. They are no more separated. But high isotactic means high stiffness which also means uh, higher brittleness, uh, less stretchability, less wax extractable. So depending on the property, uh, you have to balance also the isotacticity of the polymers. And it is influenced by catalyst, polymerization technology, polymerization parameters, and homonomer. Touching a little bit on the additives for polyolefins, the most important additives are probably antioxidant, primary and secondary. Primary is for life service to fight against the oxidative agents present in the atmosphere, in the soil. And secondary antioxidant is basically to protect the polymer during processing under the huge shear rate and the heat of the extruder. So, uh, antioxidants protect the polymer's original molecular structure and properties like color, strength, flexibility, and softness. Typically, the polymers which are going for high, long uh, life applications like your wire and cable, your uh, pressure pipe for water and gas, they are very highly additivated with antioxidants because they have to really that gives the service for a long time, whereas for disposable applications like red packaging cells and similar packaging there, the antioxidant levels are not so high. Then comes sleep again, it is for reducing the coefficient of friction, allows easy movement of film uh, on the form fill seal machine, easy unwinding of the roll. And these sleep agents are low molecular weight oils and fats, which migrate to the surface over time. And typical examples are erucamide and oleamide. And typically, uh, whenever there is a thermal history, like you have made a film, packed it, put it in the cold storage, and again, bring out any thermal history uh, affects some blooming of you know, uh, sleep agent to the surface. Anti-block. Basically, when you are not able to open a bag with your finger and it is blocking, there uh, is the need of anti-block. Uh, it, it is to control blocking of the film. Typical uh, particles used are silica and talc, which acts as a physical spacer between individual surfaces that oppose and minimize adhesion. Then comes anti-static, polymers being non-conductive accumulates electrostatic charges on surface causing difficulty in processing and dust attraction. So anti-static agents, they come on the surface over time and absorb moisture and help 
release the static charges. Typical example, sir, these are all esters. Then you have lubricant and mold release agent. Uh, the function is to come to the surface between plastic and the mold. Many times when you are doing injection molding, you can see the our product is getting stuck in the mold. You have to retract the uh, screw plunger, uh, take out the product and then spray some mold re release agent onto the metal. Nucleating agent. This is mainly used for uh, polypropylene. Uh, polypropylene on its own has very slow crystallization process forming larger spherulites which affect its optical properties and mechanical properties. Now, nucleating agents are inorganic compounds that ensure small and multiple spherulites. See, breaks down big spherulite into very, very small and distributed spherulites due to faster cooling leading to faster cooling, improving product stiffness. I mean, it has a lot of advantages. Number one, it reduces cycle time, improves the stiffness, and in some cases, even improve the clarity. All these high clarity, key fresh containers, they are mostly nucleated polypropylene grapes. A typical examples are sodium, benzoate, talc, etc. UV and light stabilizer. This is very important because uh, they prevent degradation caused by the sunlight for products which uh, have to give their life service above ground or in the air, uh, withstanding outdoor weathering resistance. A typical example is hindered amines. And carbon black is the best UV stabilizer because it completely cut off the sunlight. But in all products, carbon black cannot be used. Normally for infrastructure like pipes, rotational motor tanks, geomembrane, carbon black is the number one choice. But if you talk of gas pipes, if you talk of packaging items, there you cannot use carbon black because of the other reasons. So they are uh, UV along with the uh, color pigment is used. But uh, nothing can match uh, carbon black in performance. So typically it is said that, say for example, gas pipe made with yellow MDP and orange HDP, they are to be buried in the trench within one year of production because the non-black UV stabilizer, they can only give that much protection before the polymer starts degrading. Then you have fillers. Fillers are inorganic chemicals that not only help cost reduction but also improves mechanicals. There are a lot of functional fillers which can use thermal properties, mechanical properties, and reduce shrinkage, which is very important in some industries. Polypropylene compounds have a large market with variety of fillers, for example, calcium carbonate, talc, glass fiber, etc. And they typically, uh, automotive industry use only filled compounds of polypropylene. Then there are also polymer modifying agents, for example, peroxides, which are used for control rheology grades, where you need a very high flow for molding very large parts. And now, uh, I'll be now talking about polyolefin manufacturing processes. So, this is a brief overview. The polyolefin processes you can classify uh, on three things, pressure and catalyst, reaction media, and reactor type. And there is also catalyst design and process selection. Now, in the process, uh, you can either have polyethylene manufactured without catalyst, which is high pressure free radical process used for LDP. They are only the initiator starts the reaction and chain modifier finishes the reaction, uh, autoclave and tubular technology for LDP, but they need very high pressure and temperature. But to reduce this pressure and temperature so that they become more cost effective uh, in terms of uh, process, process cost, later on, uh, what came was low pressure technologies based on catalyst, and they are basically of three types solution, slurry, and gas phase. Under solution, you have tubular autoclave and CSTR or continuous star tank reactors. Under slurry, you have loop slurry and uh, continuous star tank reactor slurry. Under gas phase, you have fluidized bed, vertical bed, and horizontal bed. 
Now I'll go uh, according to polymers. First, let us look at the low density polyethylene manufacturing processes. Now, two most established processes worldwide one is tubular technology, another is autoclip technology. These are extremely high pressure processes. Uh, up to 3500 bar pressure is used. In case of tubular, it's a very long tube in which uh, you know ethylene and the uh, initiator, which is oxygen, is introduced and it travels to the tube under 3500 bar pressure and 160 to 300 degrees centigrade. And in different passes of the loop, it gets converted and then uh, the product is flashed. So polymer, uh, you know, gets deposited and the unconverted monomer is recycled back into the reactor. Now, because of this high pressure, uh, typically tubular reactors are, you know, encased in a maybe 10 feet thick concrete, uh, you know, wall. The entire uh, plant is within these concrete walls. And there are several decompositions in a year. Uh, next came autoclave technology, which is not so high pressure, uh, but still it is considered as a high pressure technology. But it used a uh, vessel or autoclave uh, and with a central, uh, you know, uh, shaft which uh, keeps it in circulation. Uh, while autoclave uh, uses cooling by incoming ethylene flow. Tubular reactor, the reactor is cooled through jacketed tube walls. And typically, peroxide or oxygen is used as chain modifier, initiator, and hydrogen as chain modifier. Now, coming from these high pressure technologies, uh, people slowly develop low pressure technologies. Uh, so, the first one was solution process, uh, where the monomer is dissolved in a solvent and the solvents can be cyclohexane, uh, C6 hydrocarbons or C7, C9 isoparaffins. And you can see here the pressure got reduced from 3500 bars to 25 to 100 bar and temperature 130 to 300 degrees centigrade. Residence time 1 to 10 minutes. So the process become less expensive in terms of energy cost and the process uh, uh, produce a variety of products. For example, in solution process, you can use butene uh, copolymer of polyethylene, hexene copolymer, octane copolymer, and also 4-methyl-1 pentene copolymers. Here, the catalyst used is either ziegler natta or single site catalyst. They have the capability of manufacturing MFR uh, from 0 0.2 to 100. Uh, which covers practically most of the ranges of polyethylene and they can produce from high density polyethylene to polyolefin elastomers. Quick transition, wide product range. Limitation is solvent removal from the product and catalyst deactivation. So for catalyst deactivation, typically some antacid is added so that it can neutralize the acid formed by the catalyst residue. Then comes slurry process or slurry continuous star tank reactor process. This can be either single slurry or two, three slurry reactors in series or parallel. Here the diluent is N hexane in which the polymer will be, uh, you know, which will carry the uh, polymer after the conversion. Pressure is 8 to 35 bar. Temperature 70 to 90 degrees centigrade and residence time 2 to 3 hours. So these are slower compared to solution process. Supported Ziegler Nata, single site catalyst, homonomer possible 1 butane, 1 hexane. MFR similar range 0 0.1 to 100. They can make HDP and MDP. Uh, but limitation is uh, cost inefficient compared to other process developed subsequently. Next comes gas phase process. Uh, in any uh, petrochemical complex, from a distance, you can identify which is the you know, LLDP, HDP sewing plant by looking at the shape of the gas phase reactor. And also similarly, looking at the shape of loop reactor, you can say, yes, that is the 
you know, polypropylene fan. So these gaseous reactors have got typical shape, very big vessels, and can be seen from a distance. So uh, yeah, the residence time is uh, two to three hours. Uh, pressure 20 to 35 bar, temperature 70 to 110 degrees centigrade. Supported chromium, Ziegler meta, or single site catalyst are used. A liquid only used in super condensed mode, and super condensed mode helps to increase the catalyst yield, improve the heat transfer. Because in many cases, uh, it is a problem uh, to remove heat, therefore, the yield of the catalyst is less. Therefore, there is more catalyst residue per kg of polymer, which gives yellowing of polymers. Homonomers are one butyl, one hexene, four methyl pentyl one. MFR range is 0 0.01 to 150, and from high density polyethylene to very low density polyethylene. Uh, gas phase has a uh, very wide range of polymers possible, but it cannot you know, uh, control the uh, properties within a very narrow range. So later on, it has been combined with other uh, reactors to give the best result. It's cost efficient, wide product range plus catalyst range. Limitation is product architecture, controlling the product parameters. Uh, next came slurry loop processes, which is, uh, you know, used uh, heavily in polypropylene but even high density polyethylene also slurry products are very popular. For example, Philips slurry HDP grades. Here diluent used in propane. This slurry, this loop reactor is basically a, and again a very long tube to which the uh, you know, monomer passes along with catalyst and all and to the length of the reactor, the conversion takes place. Uh, Isobutane or in hexane or propane is used as diluent. Pressure is 30 to 65 bar, temperature 75 to 110 degrees. Residence time is 0.5 to 2 hours. Butane and hexane homonomers are used. Supported chromium, Ziegler Nata, and single side catalyst. MFR 0.1 to 100 from HDP to LLDP. They are very good for low MFR HDP products like uh, you know, large uh, blow molding and high density, uh, high molecular, high density fill products. Differentiated HDP limitation is limited product range. So, uh, like we said, gas phase can produce a wide range of product, but they cannot control the parameters within a tight range. Slurry can control the product within a very tight range but they have a limitation in terms of MFI and density which they can produce. So the later uh, development was to combine these two loop and gas phase reactors to make a bimodal technology to get the best of both. So these are the different bimodal polyethylene processes. You have loop and gas phase combination, which is used by uh, Boruj Borealis under Bosca technology where the whole density range uh, possible, right from linear low density to high molecular and high density and short transition time. Then you have gas phase, gas phase, which is used in, by Unipol to evolve of Mitsui, Spiriline of Lian del Basel, where whole density range accessible, but long transition time. Then you have double slurry loop used by Yatokina, Solve and Schwadenko, no LLDP possible. Uh, limited product design capabilities, but very good high density polyethylene fits. Then you have uh, dual or triple slurry reactors, uh, which are Hostalen, Mitsui CX, uh, Equistar, and JPO. No LLDP, higher cost, and bit old technology. Then you have uh, dual or triple solution reactors which is offered by Dowlex, Advanced Clear Tape, and Equistar. Uh, no high molecular weight products and higher costs. So these are the different kind of bimodal PE processes. What Boruj uses, Boruj uses Borealis is Borstar polyethylene technology, which is a combination of a loop reactor and a, a gas phase reactor. 
uh, it makes uh, and typically you can see the pressure is like 60 bars and temperature is in the range of 95 degrees centigrade so quite a low cost uh, of energy tailoring of molecular distribution possible tailoring of density possible homonomer content and distribution we can use uh, butene and hexene contribution of individual components now uh, specialty of uh, gold star bimodal technology i'll explain it uh, graphically so this is typically a unimodal technology polyethylene molecular distribution uh, where there is a single peak and when you want to increase certain properties reduce certain properties there are uh, limitations so in bimodal technology what happens you produce one molecular peak from the loop reactor and one from the gas phase reactor now these two together makes the combined uh, bimodal molecular distribution so here you can see the advantages that you have low amount of low molecular weight components therefore your smoke order migration of additives etc is low you have got uh, more of high molecular weight components also which provides you main strength mechanical property escr and strip and here in uh, bimodal technology also the uh, lower molecular weight polyethylene helps as the processing aid for the higher molecular weight polyethylene therefore you can use uh, extremely high molecular weight products, but their processability is very easy. So improved processability is one of the major advantage, bubble stability, low sagging and low energy consumption, uh, higher uh, stiffness stress cracking balance, uh, stiffness and toughness uh, combination for film application and improved organ liquid properties. Now, this is about polyethylene technologies. Now, let me go to polypropylene technologies. Uh, this is uh, gas phase technology licensed by Dow and WR Grace. One gas phase reactor to produce homopolymer and random copolymer, and second one to produce impact and block copolymer. Ziegler, Nata, and single site is used. This is 20% of global PP licensed capacity till 2015. Then comes the uh, loop. Uh, gas phase in polypropylene, which is made popular by uh, Montel and which is now Bessel's Peripol PP process. This is bimodal or multimodal products, combination of one or two slurry loop reactors combined with one or more gas phase reactor. Zigzag meta and single side catalyst are uh, used. Complete range of PP products possible, a basket of different types of catalysts possible. Limitation is cost. Uh, Boruj uses uh, again loop gas phase uh, technology which is called Boruj bimodal process where molecular design, tacticity, morphology and yield control possible, composition in terms of homonomer, molecular distribution and molecular weight and property design like control, control biology, compounding purity and online classification. I will just mention one thing which is a specialty in Bostar technology is Bostar nucleation technology or BNT which results in higher crystallinity, better optical and mechanical properties, shorter cycle time in injection molding. So you can see here left side is non-nucleated polypropylene, middle is talc nucleated polypropylene and right side is Bostar nucleated uh, polypropylene. And how much difference does it make in terms of mechanical properties? I'm not talking of clarity at all. If non-nucleated tensile modulus is 1750 megapascal, with GNT nucleated, you can go up to 2200 megapascal. So that's a real advantage. Now, uh, let's come to the polyolefin applications. Just a few snapshots. These are typical LDP and LLDP applications, which include shrink film, uh, because they have got both uh, bi-directional shrinkage, especially LDP. We have greenhouse film for increasing the yield of the product. Uh, 
Uh, then you have geomembrane, which is used for effluent treatment, plants, canal lining to reduce the seepage loss into the ground. Then milk packaging was, is one of the largest application and it was a big innovation. Uh, maybe my uh, future speaker will talk more about it. We don't uh, realize it now, but it really revolutionized packaging of milk. Then you have wear and cable uh, coating. You have the whole range of food packaging. Uh, you have mulching and drip lateral, uh, which cuts down the usage of water by as high as 75 percent in agriculture and recently we have also tried very successfully drip irrigation for paddy which can revolutionize paddy cultivation in future and then you have you know embossed film for baby diapers and other hygiene products when you come to hdp application pipe is one of the major application and today in india up to 2500 uh, millimeter hdp pipe facility is there. Uh, you can see the photograph of a uh, sea water intake outfall line is being installed in the sea. These are used for desalination plant or chemical plants. Then you have huge application of oven sacks which are used for fertilizer, uh, full range of household containers, all the molding products for disinfectants, for cosmetics and all. Then you have uh, water pipes, a huge application. Uh, and all the new water distribution networks are with HDP pipes. And then on the bottom right, you see gas distribution. In fact, globally, 100% low pressure distribution network for gas, only polyethylene is used because it has been found in earthquake that all other kinds of pipes or joints fail. Only polyethylene pipes remain unaffected. It is because joints are always stronger than the pipe and it has got more than 600% elongation. So it will twist, elongate, but it will not flip. Coming to polypropylene application, the first photography is a sewage network. In Europe, most of the sewage pipes, double wall corrugated polypropylene pipe and the chambers, etc. are used. Uh, next photo, green color pipe, that is the plumbing pipe for hot and cold water distribution inside the house. Then you have uh, all these uh, clear Keep fresh containers, Tupperware and other companies they manufacture. You have the, where the uh, clarity is very important and nucleated grains are used. You have the automotive components, uh, and in some of the cars, even 50% by volume polypropylene materials are used. Then you have the caps and closures like Coke and Pepsi, they use polypropylene uh, injection molded caps. Water industry uses HDP compression molded caps. You have the uh, shrink levels made out of BOPP. Uh, so BOPP has got a lot of application in uh, packaging in terms of laminates and shrink film, etc. You have uh, these hygienic masks and uh, you know, disposable caps, everything, whatever you use in hospital. You have the ice cream containers. Uh, I'm towards the end of my lecture, so just two more slides. Number one is we try to redefine value chain, uh, like uh, you have feedstock, you get olefins from there, you make poly olefins and you sell it to your customers and your job ends there. But we work deep into the value chain with the end users, with the installers, create awareness, try to raise the standard so that good material can be used for good application and in your infrastructure you don't have complaints every second or third month so we have been able to uh, make a lot of change in changes in specifications and standards in indian industry and really try to upgrade the standards so that is one of our main jobs so we follow the value creation path and this is my last slide. We are very seriously working on packaging circular economy. The three key pillars of our strategy is try disruptive packaging, collaboration with value chain partners to develop disruptive packaging solution, which drive redu reduction, reuse, and recycling of uh, packaging uh, material. Then recycling, develop design for recyclability. Uh, with value chain partners, 
and partner with recyclers to create solutions and business model that incorporate recycle. Then you have advocacy, build industry relation to drive collaboration towards a truly circular economy and supporting community education projects. So my uh, uh, other co-speakers will probably talk more about these aspects. So I uh, rest my case here. Thank you very much for your patient hearing and uh, really thanks for inviting me. So Chanchalji, that was uh, really engaging. I personally thoroughly enjoyed it. For me, it was like going back into a classroom and getting educated all over again. Very insightful, very enlightening. And on behalf of Polymer Update, the Society of Polymer Science India, Mumbai chapter, and Sumaya Vidya Vihar University, I would like to truly thank you. You've actually educated us on some very interesting key topics uh, with regards to polymers and polyolefins, how polymers are synthesized, uh, types of polymerization, thank you. Thank you parameters defining polymer properties, Bosta bimodal technology. Uh, interesting to also see how Baruj works deep into the value chain, what you, in fact, one of your last slides, I found that to be very, very engaging and interesting. So thank you. In the short time given to you, you've actually uh, succinctly highlighted the very important topic of even circular economy. I mean, I know it was just one slide, but very, uh, uh, very well done. I'm confident that all of us present will leave feeling enriched with the knowledge that you shared with us today. Uh, so we will now invite the expert panel to share their perspectives, after which we will have uh, the Q&A session. Each panelist will provide their perspective for between five to 10 minutes. And uh, first panelist, uh, Mr. Neeraj Dixit, will share his perspective. Mr. Dixit is the Packaging Application Development Lead for Baruj ISC. Uh, he is a chemical engineer from HBTI. He has over 33 years of experience covering the complete polymer value chain. He's worked with Hindustan Polymers, IPCL, Reliance, Sabic, and is now with Baruj. So Mr. Neeraj Dixit, uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and I hand over the floor to you, sir. Thanks a lot, uh, Sajid. Uh... Uh, th thanks for your kind uh, uh, explanation about me. I hope you can hear me. Very, okay. we can hear you very clearly. Yes. Perfectly, all right. So Chanchal has already set the tone. Uh, he explained that how versatile the polymers are and uh, what can it bring to the table. So polymers, plastics, they have become very well known, but they are not very old materials. They are not very old material of construction. Whenever we talk about material of construction, whether we want to make uh, some small item for geometry box, stationary items, whether we go all the way from there to houseware, houseware to automotives, automotive to rocket, rockets to um, uh, anywhere. So everywhere, the versatility of polymers comes into picture. So it does offer a lot, but it's not a very long journey of polymers. Polymers started something like, um, if we say around 100 years back in 1907, for the first time, uh, a real commercial polymer was made. Uh, to start with, uh, 1907, Bakelite came, came into picture, uh, journey moved forward, DuPont introduced nylon, which at, at that point of time was very, very important uh, in the sense like uh, the world was short of silk and cotton, so nylon brought in the solutions. Then came Second World War, and uh, the world ran short of rubbers, and then the synthetic rubber came into picture. So it's not a very long journey, but within a short span of time of around 100 plus years, it has become one of the key players in the materials. If we choose the material of construction for anything to anything, plastic polymers do contribute a lot in that. So this is, uh, this is a journey which has been a very strong journey, very emphatic journey. Uh, if we talk about India, so uh, I worked with IPCL and I remember the days in late 70s, uh, IPCL brought a plant, first polypropylene plant with a capacity of 25,000 tons. And that point of time, we were thinking in IPCL, my seniors were thinking in IPCL, how exactly this 25,000 tons per year will be consumed in a country like India. And today, as Sajid has pointed out, 
we have a total polymer consumption of around 15 million out of that more than 5 million comes from polypropylene alone so see in a journey of less than 40 years or around 40 years we have grown from 25000 tons to more than 5 million tons this is about polypropylene similar as the journey for journey for polyethylene so what uh, another thing i wanted to put in my small discussion for perspective uh, what exactly drove the polymer to such a large consumption in such a short time so the devil lies in the detail i use the two words called polymer and plastics what exactly they say a lot polymer as Chanchal pointed out that you take small atoms, molecules, join them together, synthesize them. So the word synthesize comes into picture. Unlike other raw materials, whether it is glass, paper, wood, you know, metals, they have, they start right in the middle. While here we are synthesizing right from the bottom, right from the basics. So that made it so versatile that end user can demand any particular set of property or the combination of properties he wanted tough he want tough and stiff he want tough stiff and easy flow he want tough stiff and working in a particular way processable in a particular way or workable in a particular environment in terms of temperature or or, 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 or pressures so what happened over these years of 40 50 60 years the people the people who use different kind of material they kept demanding different different property combinations and polymer kept delivering and will keep delivering more because there is a possibility to alter the thing right from the basics and then you can do whatever you wish to do another word is plastic now plastic word comes from a word called uh, greek word plastikos uh, how to say that uh, it means that it is capable of molding or taking a shape or whatever shape you want easily. Um, there are not many materials of construction which can take shape easily. Say glass can be molded, clay can be molded, but they are brittle, they are not very strong. So here we have a versatile material which can be expanded into any zones wherever we wish to, over a period of time it can be developed and then it can be constructed, it can be shaped the way we want to shape it. So obviously the platform is far too big. So it has grown and I'm very, very confident it will grow further. That, that's my perception. Second thing is it has capabilities. So one of the key capability, what I see here is that it is lightweight and it is strong. Along with lightweight, it can be stiff. Along with lightweight, it can be tough. Along with lightweight, it can be transparent. It can be opaque. It can be. Uh, it can give you low temperature performance. It can give you high pressure performance. It can give you wide range of things. It is inert. So, so a simple example: what we take uh, when we talk about an inert material, we talk about the pipes. We were struggling with metal pipes which are getting corroded just to carry the potable water from the tank to our taps, not possible. We struggled for years together. Then we came in with the plastic pipes, that part was gone. It, is, it has an excellent chemical resistance. Uh, Chanchal had shown in his, uh, in his, in his uh, presentation, one of the application is we need to, in chemical industry specifically, we waste and spoil a lot of water, which has high level of COD, BOD. Can you put it in the tank? Whatever kind of tank you put them in, some amount of, these very, very difficult things will seep into the water and go into the food, go into the crops. This can stop it completely. So that is just to say the versatility, what kind of capabilities it brings in. So that becomes the second pillar which carries it forward in terms of volume, in terms of growth. And third pillar, which is uh, more like a demographic thing, is we are living in a consumption era. There is explosion of population. Obviously, it brings in a lot of consumption. There is uh, uh, urbanization that also brings in a further surge in, uh, in consumption and it will keep going on. Possibly in Asia part, we have just hit the basics. We are yet to go further. So th these two things will take us forward. But other than that also, I, what I see there is a, the demographic changes, the living style, 
people want everything to be easily available to them both both the family members husband wife do work they don't have time for the for the to manage the basic household chores so they want everything in a systematic way available to them that again run the increases the consumption so that is about consumption and then i want to say that uh, plastics do contribute uh, towards our future say coming years we will be short of many many resources if i talk very quickly about energy is going to be one of the key area of constraint by 2025 we'll be needing 40% more energy than what we need we'll be almost at the peak of our oil consumption oil production so where do we get it from we get it from some sources which can save plastics which can save energy so plastic can save energy in terms of cable we are running over at cables lot of energy losses we can cut them down by putting the proper plastic cables and we can save the energy up to the extent of 20 to 30 percent lightweight because of lightweight products if you when they are transported whether it is in terms of packaging or anything they save energy and another most important area i see that during the production of the plastic parts during the construction of the proper plastic parts the energy consumption is minimum as compared to the raw material food safety food is another aspect which is going to be short with this population boom so what do we what does polymer does to it uh, we have a certain level of certain amount of arable land so plastic with the help of greenhouses mulch film uh, uh, irrigation pipes uh, that, that brings in yields increase so that yield increase straight away has more amount of uh, food products available for us now that food product if you just transport it without proper packaging to the end user 50% of that gets wasted on the way with proper packaging report says you can save it as up to up to the extent of 47% more so 97% of the food product which is produced goes all the way up to the end user so these are the kind of things another few thing is water again where the transportation of water with the help of plastic pipes had been had been ensuring that the quality remains good so that that is another very important resources once all that said the problem area still remains one plastic has done a lot of good work but it has generated lot of end of the life waste what do we do with this waste so i could have gone on to continue and say few more more words but i would leave it to my colleague tikya bandopadhyay i believe that he is going to talk a lot on waste management so i will rather spare my time and then we can pick it up another few questions during question and answer session that's all from my side sajid thanks a lot thank you thank you so much uh, mr dikshit really that was uh, truly very interesting in the very brief time that you had but it also gives us an opportunity to invite you back for one of the future talks we have future webinars we have where we can give you the 45 minutes to only speak about the subjects where you are so passionate but i what i really enjoyed is the fact that you started from 1907 you talked about bakelite you talked about the 100 years more than 100 years of history you talked about dupont's introduction of nylon when the world was short had a shortage of silk and cotton uh, i found the fact that uh, rubber was in such a great shortage and how synthetic polymers played such a great role and of course the importance of packaging plastics and packaging transportation of water uh, and the problem area of end of life waste that is something we will leave up to our next panelist so thank you uh, mr dikshit on behalf of polymer update the society of polymer science india mumbai chapter and sumaya vidya vihar university i really do thank you for sharing your knowledge thanks with us. to the whole team thanks thanks a lot thank you yeah. uh, i would like to now ladies and gentlemen invite our next panelist mr tk bandopadhyay Uh, Mr. Bandhupya Upadhyay is the technical technical director at Indian Council for Plastics in Environment. He has over 45 years experience in raw material manufacturing industry uh with both IPCL and Reliance uh processing industry at a company called oh if rather in East Anglia and is associated with ICP right now. So Mr. Bandhupadhyay this is a great honor the floor is now yours sir. Mr. Bandopadhyay, are you there, sir? You are on mute. You are on mute, sir. 
Mr. Bandapadhyay, you're on mute. We cannot hear you, sir. You just have to unmute yourself. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now we can hear you, sir. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, because I, I was unmuted by the host. Ah, sorry. Okay, okay, okay sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Majid, uh, for your enlightened uh, talk uh, 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 during the beginning of this uh, webinar session. And I also thank uh, Professor Pillai for inviting me for uh, being here. And uh, with a, a, a humble thank you to uh, Chanchal, he cited me as guru before his starting. So, uh, we were all colleagues in IPCL, uh, Nidaj also. So in the plastic, as all of us know, we are from the plastic industry. I think uh, the, our participants also are from plastic. So there will be some other segment of the uh, people. Uh, 2018, I would say, 2018 was the awakening uh, slogan by United Nation Environment Day, that there was a declaration against this single-use plastics. And just see, 2020, same United Nations that UNDP, they had come out with another report that which nullifies the other report which they had, they themselves had published in 2018. I'm talking about the Benefits, so much benefits are there. We in the plastic fraternity, we are aware of, the, of it. But perhaps we were not able to uh, propagate it properly or bring, bring it to the notice of the policymakers and all that, that how plastics are good, beneficial. Of course, the, the particular uh, fact that plastic waste is creating a disturbing situation all over the world. That cannot be uh, negated, that cannot be avoided, but still that does not mean that what all are the benefits of plastics. I would say there are five benefits of plastics. Maybe the greenhouse gas saver is the top one. And one problem is there no plastic waste management. Yes. See, as per uh, the record, in 2016, we produce about close to 350 million tons of plastics at, uh, presently. 2016, the record says, some of the expert uh, record says, the plastic waste generation was 215 million ton, because it is not only one year production, all accumulated waste from the past, 215 million tons. But again, the report says the recycle, recycling was only to the tune of 20%, and about 50% of plastic waste, waste was discarded. This is little, uh, the particular um, to, point to be noted. This is disturbing. 50% of the uh, 215 million ton plastic waste was discarded. That is uh, not good for the whole uh, earth. And what I feel, there are other uh, uh, disturbing uh, statistics given by the United Nations. Uh, it is given the total production of plastics from 1950 from to 2015 is about 90 billion ton. Out of it, it says only 9% plastics have been recycled. That is also disturbing. And uh, I have a doubt of the authenticity, correctness of, of this data. So that day uh, I and Chantal was discussing the pipe, plastic pipe has got a life of about 90 years, 100 years. Plastic cables have got a life of 70 years. Even my Calcutta house has got, a, I had uh, put plastic cables in 1965. It is good now, as now also, the 70 years, 80 years. All along this uh, period from 1950 to 2015, 
where all these pipes and all that are still intact. This has, there is no question of these products being recycled. So whether these body who have declared that only 9% plastics have been recycled, have they considered that how many, how much plastics are still there in, in use? So that calculation data is required to be brought out to the policymakers, to the general mass. Of course, not um, 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 neglecting the, uh, the, uh, the fact that plastic makes the, the um, uh, waste wherever it is not managed properly. But as per record, we know Western Europe, Norway, they recycle about 97% nice in Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, they, there is, uh, I believe that report is there, there is no landfill. So the figures are there, Japan, Japan is uh, handling tremendously good. But there are places where plastics are being not managed and it is creating problem. And one particular problem aspect is being focused in such a high volume, high uh, 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 pixel that it attracts the attention. But I am happy to note that UNDP report of 2020, which says that plastic bag, single-use plastic bag is more environment friendly than paper bag, except the littering aspect. So that we, we had been telling from the industry has been focusing this point. But uh, once the UN body says something in 2018, they had restricted something. Of course, yes, uh, we also uh, agree to some items uh, can be avoided, but not that plastic single use plastic bag. But we have responsibility of managing the single use plastic bag also. But environmentally, it has been stated by the same UN body that single use plastic bag is more environment friendly than paper bag, ex except the uh, littering aspect. See, this, this particular uh, waste management, there is a particular hope, good hope is there. Uh, many global leaders of the corporate body, users, they have declared varying from 25 to 50% of their used material product requirement for their packaging, they will be used using recycled plastic products. See, there but the uh, Coca-Cola is there, Procter and Gamble is there, Colgate, Palmolive, all the giants of the uh, corporate giants of the uh, users world of leaders. They have declared that up to fifty percent of the products they will be using by recycled. What will will be the effect? The recycling. Will uh, material will go into that direction, and virgin requirement also will come down to uh, to that extent. But that also the volume, whatever has been calculated on the 2016-17 I mean, present uh, uh, stage, that counts for about nine nine to between nine to fifteen million ton. That is not enough. So the circular economic concept I'm coming coming because time is uh, limited. Circular economy concept, uh, India, so far as India is concerned, India, we use um, recycled uh, to the great extent uh, 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 by gov government st statistics also say between 60 to 70 percent we recycle, unlike the many developed countries. Uh, but it is not enough and some product we recycle more than 90 percent, some bottles the pet bottle we are we recycle more than 90 percent because we don't find a pet bottle uh, littering in the uh, anywhere because of the cost but so the circular economy gives a focus of making no waste only biodegradable waste or gaseous waste uh, in indian context or not only indian many other places wherever recycling is not feasible, no, I mean viable to the investor, those, those countries, those situations, we must adopt the other modes of uh, energy recovery, even if it may not give impetus to the value to the plastics per se, but 
See, say for instance, uh, co-processing in the cement cleaning. The if we uh, substitute coal, we in India we use thirty million ton of coal. Germany, they use seventy percent. They have substituted seventy percent of coal by plastic waste. And in in, in India, if we can replace ten percent, we replace about. We started with the trial in uh, way back in two thousand eight. Uh, which has been uh, ultimately approved by government of in the India CPCB. So there we use only three percent. Now, if we can replace coal by ten percent only, that will give us a plastic uh, requirement of three million ton of plastic waste. That are also plastic waste which are which cannot be mechanically um, uh, recycled by the uh, recycler to get a value. All the uh, real waste. Which are uh, discarded, and this also can go to the cement mill. And if we can replace, go to the value of twenty percent, we will be able to reach a figure of six million ton. So this particular energy, uh, um, uh, this method of energy recovery through the cement, uh, cement co-processing in cement mill is a though perhaps it will not form in the formula of circular economy. But definitely, it will be able to avoid the waste management problem. Uh, I will not uh, go further. That only one responsibility part: who should manage the waste? That, as on today, some particular um, uh, community has been entrusted to that. Uh, I was a part of the 2016 Plastic Waste Management. Uh, Um, 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 rule draft drafting committee. The raw material manufacturers have not been included as on now. The end users, yes, they have included, but we don't see their actual action. Like unlike in Germany, the uh, all the um, end users they are um, religiously contributing to the green dot fund. Otherwise, they have to manage their own waste themselves, which is practically not possible by them. It is against their viability. But in India, we have not been able to reach that particular uh, policy thing. So this, uh, with this uh, aspect, I think uh, I will not go uh, further. uh if any the question is there uh, i can take it so thank you very much mr bandopadhyay you know uh as far as anything to do with recycling and the circular economy is concerned it's very close to our heart as well at polymer update we have a product called recycling and the circular economy and that's uh, the acronym for or rather it's called race and race is the acronym for recycling and the circular economy we host regular conferences we'd be delighted to invite you there for one of our conferences to share your perspective as you have done in such a brief period of time in the short period you've actually managed to educate us on so much so we thank you for that uh we are very happy to learn about coca cola which we've known about about colgate but i agree there's a lot a lot more that we have to do a lot more that india has to do and today is the age of disruption in any industry you look at whether it's education uh whether it's entertainment you're seeing businesses being disrupted like never before i'm of the belief that if somebody can come and pinpoint the irony of plastics today is that the very thing which makes it special which it's which is its long lasting and durability is the thing which is because of human beings irresponsibility in a certain sense and also that we haven't invented further or or learned what to do with it that's also its downfall in many ways and has given rise to the hashtag say no to plastic yeah. we have to collectively get together and try and say yes to plastic because plastic really is a magic material and if the world has discovered the product and it's made such a tremendous difference to us in our lives then we have to try and understand how to protect it and how to treat it with respect and how to get all the um stakeholders involved uh, to you know take it forward from that linear to the circular economy mm -hmm. So I think there was there is one example which comes to mind. There's a company called Philips. All of us know it well. Uh, they make the light bulbs, and somewhere in Europe, uh, they have started this effort towards uh, the move from a linear to a circular economy, where large offices they don't purchase the light bulbs. All they do is they uh, lease them, 
and they've got these huge offices of 15, 20, 30,000 square feet where they lease the light bulbs. And if a few light bulbs go off, they don't take it up and discard it. The Philips people come, they remove it, they collect it, immediately replace it, take it back to their factory. They're able to salvage almost 90, 95% of the light bulb and they put that back in the new light bulbs they make. Now that is a perfect example of what a circular economy is all about. So it's not only the plastic industry which needs to move from linear to circular, but all the industries together have to come together and do something about it. So it's really a wonderful subject. We can talk about it for hours and hours, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Mr. Bandopadhyay, on behalf of Polymer Update, the Society of Polymer Science India, Mumbai chapter, and Sumaya Vidya Vihar, I would like to thank you for sharing your very, very deep knowledge with us. Uh, we you. now Thank come you. to the uh, Q&A session, uh, and uh, I have received a few questions which I would like to share mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with the panel, uh, and in fact, with uh, the main speaker. So this first one, uh, if I may, Chanchal, comes to you. In fact, there are quite a few for you, so I may just direct these few to you. Uh, how does Indian polyolefins raw material quality compare with global producers? Well, I think uh, many of the Indian grades, they are treated as benchmark in foreign countries. For example, I know the Indian uh, Rafia grade, Indian uh, uh, film grade, especially in China, there is there was huge demand of material being exported from India. Uh, so India has got more or less all the latest uh, technologies, whether you talk of Mitsui, whether you talk of uh, Vassal, whether you talk of, you know, uh, uh, any any other, you know, advanced process, whatever is their state of the art, uh, anywhere else in the world, most of the technologies are present in India. And uh, uh, Indian uh, export is quite substantial raw material export and uh, Indian material is uh, quite valued high in different countries. So this actually links up quite well with the next question which has come in. Uh, so is there may I, so please, may please, I supplement please. may I supplement the answer yes, of given course, by of course. Please, like please please Mr. Dixon please. Yeah because this question is uh, is good um, and this is like uh, in India uh, for polyolefins, at least I can vouch for that more or less we have all technologies available. So, and if you look at the, even the, the even the import export balance or the consumption and the production balance, so we are something like uh, 10 to 10 to 10 and a half million tons of polymer is consumed in 2019, and a similar amount is produced. But there is a uh, there is around a million ton of polymer going out, a million ton of polymer coming in. So what exactly is it all about? So what it says that, say around 90%, give or take here and there, of the requirements of different applications are more or less met with whatever is produced in India. But there is always 10% which are more like a customized solutions. Few examples I can take, very straightforward. Some is that uh, a specialized P100 pipe kind of material, uh, iron cable compounds for uh, high voltage and extra high voltage uh, kind of uh, materials. Um, if you talk about uh, for shrink film kind of products, uh, there are speciality LLDP materials, there are metallocene LLDP materials, there are metallocene PP materials. These are all a comparative like a technology ahead for India as of now. But the consumption also so low that the technology doesn't find space as in today. All in all, India is quite self-sufficient at point one, but there is always a 10% area where specialized solutions from outside worlds are coming in. Okay, excellent. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you stepped in with that point of view as well. Uh, so there's one question which has actually come to me, but I would also like to open to Mr. Bandupadhyay. And the question is from a gentleman called Anish. It says, as we all see, plastic waste has skyrocketed during the pandemic. Uh, so there are much chances of increasing in pollution. Isn't it after this pandemic, another problem will uh, emerge? Uh, so we're moving from one issue, one problem into another. 
Uh, so, uh, Mr. Bandopadhyay, would you like to take that? And thereafter, I'd share my okay. point of view as well. Okay. Uh, I am a uh, COVID-affected person. I had been there in the uh, quarantine center. Uh, I, my practical uh, um, uh, experience, I can tell you, all the plastic waste which has been which is being generated in the hospitals and the this quarantine center and the treatment centers are being taken care of. It, they are being packed uh, separately and are being these can be recycled. There is no harm in collection of the large volume the uh, the waste of the uh, aprons, uh, hand gloves, hand gloves of course the plastic hand gloves also there. Rubber hand gloves also can are taken separately. All these can be are can be uh, recycled and they are packed together. Only the problem is there are cases nowadays that some patients, some uh, members, they perhaps stay in house, and that collect waste collection system, I believe, is not that good. At, at the society level, we don't uh, see any red color or uh, the yellow colored bags. If they put it in the same dry waste. Uh, if there are two bin culture they are maintaining, if they, they are put in the dry waste culture, that is a cause of concern. That needs, although bi biomedical waste uh, rules are there, but that is applicable. All the hospitals, quarantine centers, and all that, they are maintaining the standard and it will not cause any uh, problem. It, it will be taken to the either recycling centers and uh, following the uh, guidelines and all that, if it, they will be recy either recycled or if if it cannot be recycled, it will be taken care of by incineration. Incineration. Uh, incineration. But, but the problem is, people. We have we got some uh, uh, picture that uh, before attending some uh, funeral uh, ceremony, people discarded their removed their uh, gloves and put it there. So this sort of thing has to be stopped. If uh, this has to be stopped, otherwise spreading yes spreading is possible, but this particular uh, spreading from the uh, organized thing, like the hospital, quarantine center, and the medical center, it is ruled out because they take care of it. But on the, uh, the mass consumption and usage, we should be aware of it. There are some proper awareness is required. Uh, Mr. Bandupadhyay, on this point, uh, does not the Indian government have any regulation in place? Because what you've talked about is in the urban hospitals, but we know now that uh, the pandemic has spread even to rural areas and the smaller hospitals out there, do they have a system of collection, waste collection? And, uh... all, all the hospitals and the nursing homes and all that, all these especially, they are uh, bound by this uh, biomedical waste rule. So they, they have to put it in, inside the bag. So this, this, this has to be put inside the bag, preferably the yellow and the red bags. And if it is not there, even in plastic bag, black plastic bags, it has to be put there and it has to be handed over to the proper uh, channel. And uh, it has got a very good recycling value. And as we know, if, if it can be stored for seven days, there will not be any corona virus staying in that because life uh, inside the plastic is about more, not more than three days. So, mm. and, and uh, they die uh, 70 degrees centigrade, they get uh, dis uh, dis uh, affected, and 100 degrees centigrade, that is no question of living. So, recycling is not at, at all a problem. It has to be collected and properly packed in plastic bag. And kept for at least some time, three, four, five days, then move out. If it is mixed with some other uh, non-plastic thing, then that is another, that is a question of uh, uh, incineration. Well, I honestly pray with all my heart that we won't have a second pandemic. Uh, certainly not. I think that's what we all hope. But uh, I, I hope that the government of India also steps forward and makes it uh, incumbent on uh, citizens to be more responsible when it comes to yes, discarding yes. of their masks, 
because what happens is we may use mm -hmm. uh, masks and not many people cut their masks. Of course, I'm not talking about the washable cloth masks. I'm talking about the, uh, the, the throwaway mask, the discardable uh, mask. It should be cut and then discarded. But unfortunately, people don't do that. So you do have people who can collect it and resell it. And there's always that fear if it's not done uh, or it's done before that seven day period, then there could be reinfections if that mask is infected. But having said that, we cannot take away from the fact that polymers has played such an absolutely crucial role in, in helping and containing the spread of the yes. virus, be yes. it the mask, be it the shield, uh, be it the PPE, PPE suit. So again, we yes. come back to the fact that it is such an important product, uh, which has uh, again played such a key, key role. Uh, the next question, if I may just quickly put across the Chanchalji, and I think we have about five more minutes before we can call no, it. We have uh, already exceeded the time, sir. Oh, we it have. It was 4.30. When... Oh, I'm, I'm so yes. sorry. I was so, so I need to intervene now because we need to thank the speakers. And uh, I, I, I will have to ask Dr. Avdani to do the thanks. I'm so sorry to cut you short, but uh, this uh, was really oh. exceeding the time. So I, I beg your pardon. I was actually no, 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 not at all, not at all, sir. So no, no, no. It was from three to four thirty p.m. Right. And uh, it's about going to be five uh, p.m. So I thought I need to intervene. I'm glad you did. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, Doctor uh, uh, Avdhani, if you are there, we would request yes, you. Yes, I am there. To... Yes, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. certainly, yes. certainly. Yes. All right. It was such a pleasure to hear the speakers. On behalf of the, the Department of Polymer Science, Somya Vidya Bihar, the Society of Polymer Science India, Mumbai chapter, the Society of Polymer Science India, and on my own behalf as a treasurer of Society of Polymer Science India, I wish to thank all for attending this wonderful webinar on Journal of, Journey of Polymers to Plastics, the polyolefins. The perspectives by the doings of polymer industry was really great. Our gratitude is to Sri Sajid Mehta, founder and co-CEO of uh, Polymer Organics. Very excellent. He seems to be bringing the to the fore. He's doing it as a recycling, circular economy, education, laying a promising perspective on polymers. He was a chair and he introduced the subject and the speakers. Next, we thank the speakers themselves. Chanchal Da, Chanchal Babu, Chanchal Babu Das Gupta, Application Manager of Baruj India Limited. We'll all agree that it was a very, very impressive talk. It almost took us to the classroom, trying to relate polymers, properties, functions, and eventually applications. He took us through all the various aspects of it. It was very, very, very impressive. The perspectives by Neeraj Dixit Manager, Service Tech, is also very good. And his exposition was excellent. Several things, and we all appreciate that. Then we had the exposition by Bandhu sir. He talked of environment and the, and the impact of these polymers and environment. I have worked on recycling and polymers, so I know how difficult it is to sell the concept of recycling to the industry. But nonetheless, we have to do a lot to bring a closure to this polymer being bad and bring it to society. Somebody said no to plastics. Sajid and I will agree that we must say yes to plastics and bring out a way to use the plastics in such a way that they do not become a nuisance. And our friends from across the borders, Rameshwar Adhikari and Professor Jyoti Giri from Nepal, they saw merit in joining this webinar. I'm very thankful to them for coming. We must thank the lifeline of this society, the, the heart of this society, the heart of this whole webinar. Must thank Gita Bhutila and Aparna Malik for the entire team who put this webinar possible, make it possible. Lastly, we must thank Professor VNR Pillay, Vice Chancellor Samaya Vidya Vihar, Padma Madam, Vandana Madam, Vajanti Madam for putting this Herculean task of inter, inter uh, uh, internet working all the doings of polymer industry into this great webinar. Thank you one and all, and welcome back for future webinars. Thank you.
So I, I was compulsorily uh, muted for the last <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everybody. Of course, uh, I have uh, told that we can even extend for 10 more minutes, but probably during the last 10, 15 minutes, I was completely muted. I, I just called Vandana and then I got to speak. Thank you very much. Of course, um, this is uh, probably a starting of discussion on this topic, polymers to plastic. Of course, uh, just two, I mean, four weeks ago, we had a talk from uh, senior vice president of RIL, Dr. Virendra Kumar Gupta, who is also the uh, vice president of the uh, Society of Polymer Science India, again about uh, the poly polyolefins, more of chemistry, uh, the catalyze, catalyze on it. Now, this was a logical continuation of that. Very looking at the ground, the basic grounds, and then looking at the perspective, looking at the uh, looking at the future, the different. Uh, of course, uh, in the chairman's address, he was also mentioning about the different, maybe uh, the economic growth which we are going to expect uh, as the next as the next phase. And uh, I am very sure that uh, this particular uh, webinar today, we will have more, we, as the chairman rightly mentioned, we will have from Neeraj um, as well as from TK uh, Bandhapathyaya, we will have further continuations of this discussion. That is the type of dialogue and in the continuous interventions which we are thinking of. Uh, let me, of course, I, I wanted to put a question to Barosh. Would, I would like to know about the Borosh Global R&D Innovation Center in Abu Dhabi. Uh, what are the opportunities for young researchers? What are the opportunities for trained polymer scientists? Uh, of course, we talk about it. It, it is very important that we, should, we have to look at our youngsters and the capacity building for them. And of course, I am aware of this particular center. And I would like to know, maybe not now, I would like to know. Uh, I will get. I will write back to uh, Mr. Chandran Das Gupta or Mamendri Dekshit. I would like to more know more about the R and D Innovation Center, which is happening there, and what type of uh, capacity building and what kind of uh, collaboration with academic institutions can be possible in India. Because you all know about. We all go to the other countries for um, you know, in, uh, industrial support and all that industry. So it is very important that we should empower our, our institutions, our youngsters. I know a large number of youngsters here itself, today's attendance itself, work, I mean, work to abroad and uh, looking to work abroad for future capacity building. I don't want an answer right now. Definitely, I will be definitely asking you for a presentation on such aspects as well. Thank you very much. Um, of course, can you, uh, everybody, the chair, chairperson, the polymer update. Actually, this is, was a joint act with you, the polymer update. I am also aware that the Polymer Update is looking at academic interventions. The Polymer Update Academy, I do not know whether he has announced it. Uh, of course, that's also uh, coming, Polymer Update Academy and international uh, intervention, which, which he is thinking. And, uh, the, and then Chanchal Daskupta for the very bright uh, lecture, which is understandable, uh, right from the uh, uh, but that undergraduate students to top researchers and top industries. And looking right from polymerization start and the property relations, very really academic lecture and combined with the perspectives, industrial perspective and the share uh, sharing of perspectives by both of them. They were really good. Let me, on behalf of the Somaya Vidya Vihar University, Polymer Update and the, uh, the Society of Polymer Science India let me once again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you everybody. Of course, to my colleagues in the departments, let me thank all of them for facilitating such discussions. I think um, for the last few webinars, we have seen that some 15 minutes extra is needed, probably from next, because this is not just one presentation. This is a group discussion. Probably I understand that this, we will definitely make it to two hours. Uh, two hours, uh, this particular inter interaction sessions. But as I mentioned, this is a beginning. This, we are going to start interaction with others. And I will be definitely troubling you or writing to you on, for such interventions with academic institutions. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So we are leaving, no?